Hello, it is Machine Learning Prospects and Applications 2015. We are in Berlin in the office of Yandex and we have Jane Zabolishkina, the CEO of Yandex Data Factory, who is very kind to talk with us today. Thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. YDF is an uh, inner startup. What, what's the difference between inner startup and outer startup? Like inside startup, what does it mean? It's the, the, the first inside startup I heard of, so. No, actually, I think it's, that's not the first one. It's quite a, quite a typical situation when you have some new initiative which is not proven yet within the, some bigger company. And this initiative is actually quite different from the main business of the company. Uh, very often happens that it's for some time it develops within the company and then it got spinned off. That's pretty much the situation with the Index Data Factory. Because um, to a question about what, what is the difference with the other startups, yeah. we in fact have a lot of machine learning startups out there. Well, especially sure. if you look at US market, right? Yeah. The difference of Yandex Data Factory is that we stay on the shoulders of giants, right? Okay. We are not a startup in the pure meaning of this word. We are a startup in terms of business because it's yeah. totally new, totally different business for Yandex. Yandex has no experience, no position, no brand, in fact, and the business we are trying to build. On the other hand, we are so much more mature in terms of technology and expertise and people we have around yeah. uh, than your typical startup. So you're sort of combining the technological expertise and the known B2C, uh, B2C brands? So we're kind of trying to get, yeah, you know, all this um, cherries from the cake, yeah, like yeah. Best, Connecting from the boss world. <laughs> best from the boss worlds, from startup world, because we uh, act pretty much independently. Uh, we build our own strategy, our own business plan. Uh, we speak directly to the board. On the other hand, we use all the resources and advantages we can from Yandex. Mostly, of course, we are speaking about the scientific background, the technologies the Yandex already net, has. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course, matrix net is actually um, key for more than half of our projects, I think more like 80%. So apparently this is a new area. It is. And it seems to be a bit stiff in a sense that there are a lot of people who want to get there from different sides, starting from consultancy uh, and finishing with startups, especially on the US market. You'll be surprised. Yeah, will I? You'll be surprised. It's just the opposite of being stiff. Really? Yeah. And why is because it's so new. In fact, in most of the cases, I would say 98% of our cases so far, uh, we do not see any competitors when we start speaking to the, to, the, to the customer. And the biggest problem so far is, I mean, while of course, just as you said, there are a lot of companies which are trying to do that. Okay. It's just the potential itself is so huge, you basically can try, um, um, can, can try and apply uh, machine learning technologies and machine learning based services into, well, it's pretty much any industry and most of the businesses there, which is huge, you know, potential applications. Yeah, sure. So even this many companies which are appeared or refocused to this machine learning based uh, analytics, it's still kind of a small, it's small tiny part of fraction. It. You of really the very problem. rarely meet with any of them on the client. Okay. With, sometimes you do, of course. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, second thing, but still, I mean, sometimes you can catch up with, with your competitors, but mostly your biggest problem will not be competition. Your biggest problem will be, uh, well, basically the business culture and understanding of business of these previous generations of managers who have no idea what machine learning is and how to apply it to their business. Because it goes kind of against their habits and their uh, typical ways of doing Moreover, things. sometimes it goes against their authority, right? And they have their expert opinion it on It actually something. depends. Yeah. It depends on the, how smart they are and in which position <laughs> they are trying to put themselves. Because okay. uh, the smart manager would, in fact, embrace these new, new technologies which can make his part of business he's responsible for more efficient. So he could show better results and uh, also explain these better results uh, with the innovations he's bringing to the company, which is always good nowadays. You know, it's always you should have to check that you are innovating. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> so the smart manager would do that. But on the other hand, yes, there is still this you know, tendency to try and say, yeah, of course, we'll do it all inside. Where Definitely, we yeah, are we got enough so many, resources, we are enough so expertise. many years in this industry. What these guys with their mathematics can do, which we, which we can't, and so on. 
Um, so how do you find this criticism? Um, basically, the only way to do that is to, well, first, to find the person who actually is responsible for the results. Because the great thing about uh, machine learning services we provide is that it's not just, you know, we sell you some license or some software and do whatever you want with it and uh, we do not care what error is. No, it's just vice versa. The whole idea of implementing this machine learning service is to improve your bottom line. We are looking specifically for the problems where we solving the problems where we can um, measure direct economic effect. We can see how much more sales we are doing, or we can see how much costs we are optimizing using this new technology. But that means that you need to find a person who is responsible for exactly that. He doesn't care how many people will be doing that. He, what he wants to do, he wants to have better results, basically more money or less costs, and do not overpay for that. And this is our type of person. So we mostly address not you know, IT guys, CIOs, or even all these people, we mostly address business people. That's the first thing. And second thing you do, and again, it's pretty much the only way, uh, you measure. Yeah. What yeah. we say is, guys, of course we can talk to each other, we tr can try to you know, convince each other that we are smart or they are smart, or we are both very smart, that it's not about it. It's not about our egos or uh, our authority or even expertise. It's about facts. It's about data. So the easiest thing to do is just to experiment. And this is a very important thing uh, that businesses need to learn to fully employ um, machine learning and to fully enjoy the advantages the machine learning can bring to them. Because they need to start experimenting and measuring it. It's not about opinion. It's not about authority. It's just about facts. You put this predictive model into work, you see, you do some experimental, I don't know what it is, ads or making next batch of steel as our another project. Yeah. Uh, and you measure the difference. As simple as that. And you can evaluate exactly how much money are you going to save or receive. In what sort of way do you provide these services? Is it, is it a, you know, a long, time, a long term contract and is it a long term program when from time to time uh, data scientist yeah. from YDF uh -huh. comes to the business and tunes the model depending on the market or is it a one time solution or it's all of that depending on the business like how does it work? Actually exactly? the thing is that uh, one time solution doesn't make much of sense yeah, in this right. kind of thing right because why uh, why you, when you implement this um, machine learning predictive model for example right or well, some prescriptive algorithms making automatic decisions and you know, sending some automatic messages or whatever. You do that, but by doing that, you influence the reality, right? Because yeah. you change it, because, which means that it changes and you need to rebuild your predictive model anyway. So uh, what we are doing now is mostly uh, long-term contracts. Well, long-term, it all depends. Uh, how long-term is it? It depends, but usually, of course, we measure them in years. And this is kind of a subscription. So what we basically have in this contract, we have some uh, criteria uh, for quality of model. Because, as I said, right, what we are aiming to bring to the business is not you know, sell them something and then they can deal with it, but bring the, some real value. So we need to make sure that they do receive the value they are paying for. So we have this in our contract that um, our, our results are not less than that, not worse than that. Specific measurements or specific KPIs or specific um, numbers depend, of course, well, and change case by case. But that's what the contract is about, that you want, well, for example, uh, well, I don't know, for churn prediction, mm -hmm. we want them that our uh, accuracy will be not less than that, and we subscribe for such term. So now it's up to us how we work with this model, how we make sure that it only becomes better, not worse and it still complies with the requirements we are responsible for. You're sort of bringing an innovation, innovation within different fields, and um, we've been talking with uh, Professor Schalkup from Max Planck Institute recently, and he had a great metaphor. He said that I uh, switched from physics to statistics because statistics allowed me to play in the backyard of every science. And um, so now he's running experiments starting from astronomy, finishing with biology. Right. And you're pretty much doing the same, but for the business. You can play in the backyard That's true. of That's banking. Mutually. But apparently there are competitors. So you're bringing innovation, and apparently there is a company who took this innovation first. So what's the policy about the competition within 
the area because uh, say I don't know there are two companies that uh, that are telecom and working on the same market mm -hmm. and then the other comes to you and says hey you guys implemented that to them we want the solution for us how, how do you work with that situation there are actually two different answers to this question depending on the angle yeah uh, on one hand it's quite a rare case but on one hand we can consider sometimes with some industries where which are let's say oligopolic when you don't have hundreds or thousands of competitors, but you maybe only have three or five of them. Tele telecom is a classical example, uh, In this case, sometimes we can uh, negotiate some kind of exclusive agreement with one of these players uh, for some period of time. Okay. Because, of course, for if you have only three or five of them, it's for them very important uh, to, you know, to make sure that their competitive advantage stays, stays there. On the other hand, in fact, um, you know, machine learning predictive model can give you the answers, but it cannot ask you questions, right? I mean, right. explain which questions you need to ask. And the thing is, for example, in retail, uh, we almost never get this kind of question about this, you know, going to, to the competitors. Uh, on one hand, because it's not a oligopolic market, it's quite an open one, there are a lot of players. But on the other hand, that's because they actually, we work with different companies there, they actually ask very different questions. Let me give you an example. Uh, when you are trying to um, upsell or cross-sell to your existing customers, right? You are sending them some offers you want them to, to, to accept, of course. So you can optimize different things doing that. And one of our first clients, the task was just as simple as money, right? Uh, they have their own formula for so-called NPV, net positive yeah. value. So you basically try and um, uh, evaluate the amount of money you will generate from the service during the uh, well, lifetime of the service. So they just want to maximize money they receive from these offers that are sending to the customers. But that's not always that, because with another company, uh, what they wanted to have is to have, well, they are selling some subscription-based products. And what they wanted to have, they wanted to have their customers to be subscribed to two and more products from the company. Because strategically it was important for them. Because uh, they knew from, well, and it wasn't their strategy, that when the client is subscribed to more than half products, it stays more loyal, it spends more with you, and blah, 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 you have much more consequences, much wider scope of consequences, which, which is desirable for them. So we basically work with the same business process, very simple business process of um, offers to the existing customers. And we have totally different Yeah, so different questions is it, yeah, arise different so, approach. So, and because the different companies have different strategies, in fact, each and every service is still kind of unique. It actually can be based on this pretty much same technologies, right? As I said, in probably 80% uh, of our current solutions, we, we base them or we heavily use MatrixNet. Yeah. But the specifics, the specific metrics, we are, we are looking for specific KPIs we need to achieve. The features you work with are very different. And yeah, and uh, in this case, they don't really much care about the competitors because it has nothing to, it's not about yeah, us right. making them more efficient and making competitors more efficient. Now, because all of them can use machine learning, it's about their strategies. It's about how right their strategies are, and that's something they are responsible for. Thank you very much for the talk. We had Jane Zavalishina, the CEO from Yandex Data Factory. Thanks a lot. That was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.